Hey there, my name's Stevie Taylor. Welcome to episode 59 of the Gig Life Podcast. Today is Jack Houston, guitarist, singer, songwriter, producer, and musical director from Sydney. Jack started playing guitar at 11 years old because in 1980, Jack's older brother Stephen Houston's band opened for the police at the Horty Pavilion. Now, after seeing that show, it was a life changing light bulb moment for Jack, and from that day on, guitar is what he needed to be doing. Now, during his career, Jack's played in the Daryl Braithwaite band, was a founding member of the Bad Loves has been a member of the Whitlam since playing on their 1999 album Love the City, is currently in superstar Tim Minchin's band, as well as a heap of other stuff that we talk about in this episode. Jack has a deep love for the 60s, the style, the feeling, the sound, and this really comes out in his new solo music, which you're listening to right now. This song is called Bombs. We also talked about his recording process, how he comes up with the sounds, embracing new technology, but also holding true to the belief that his sound starts back up the chain with his fingers on his guitar. Now, Jack's a cool cat. This was a real laid-back hang. So let's do it, ladies and gentlemen. Please give it up for Jack Houston. Cheers. I think we're rolling. Jack Housden, welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. Thank you, Stevie. It's a pleasure to be here. No worries, man. So now what's, let's say, what's the last week been up to? What have you been up to this last week? And then we'll roll back to your early days, early inklings, okay. beginnings. Well, I've had a, I've had a very full-on busy year and for the first chunk of it. And um, the last few weeks I guess I've had fairly free and I've been working on my own music in my studio, recording, staying up till very, very late, till the wee hours, singing my heart yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I've been doing quite a bit of that and, um, and now I've sort of drawn a little bit of a line in the sand where this week I've kind of got to knuckle down and do some other stuff yep. and... Um, beginning today, which was, so on the weekend, on Saturday night, I'm playing with Richard Clapton at the Enmore mm. Theatre, and um, and I've played with Richard quite a bit, but I haven't played with him with two guitar players before, and on this show, we have two guitar players, the other one being Matt Smith, so... And you, I, when, I, when I turned up, you'd <clears> just been on the phone with him for... An hour yeah, and a half. we've been making this big M- map of mud map. Who's going to do what bits? Yeah. And um, yeah, it was actually really good though because many of the songs that I kind of thought, okay, I'd love to do that. He's like, great, because that's the one that I like. You know, I don't feel as comfortable doing. So yeah, and vice versa. So yeah, it's actually I think it'd be really cool because mm. we. We're similar enough but different enough for it to be to have the two shades of mm. colour. Yeah. That's cool. And mm. next month you're heading overseas with Tim Minchin. Yeah. Pretty mm. soon. Mm. A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. I right. guess it yeah. is. Yeah, it yeah, is it like is. Yeah. It, it really is like a couple of weeks. So that's like <laughs> um yeah, that's quite a long run. Yeah. And we'll, so we'll talk a bit yeah a bit about that a bit later on. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, Ben, let's wind back right 
to the beginnings. Um, now your um, parents are from from uh, England. England, yep, yes. And they decided to move here. Yep. So let's you know talk a little bit about that before my time. Yeah, before your time. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So um, yeah. So my parents. So I've got a brother who's also plays guitar mm-hmm. very very well. Yep. <laughs> and um, and. So they came out here in 1959, which is 10 years before I was born, mm. and um, they wanted to escape the cold and come out here. And my parents uh, also, <clears throat> my parents um, played music. My mum played the accordion and my and and sang, and my dad sang. And and uh, in those days, they used to play the xylophone as well. And they had they do like club shows, you know, mm. variety acts. Mm. Variety shows, I guess you call them, club entertainment. So they came to Australia and um, first of all landed in Melbourne and hung there for a little while. Then realised the club scene is where it's at in Sydney. Mm. So they got in the car, drove up here, mm. and um, yeah, settled here. And I think they had some friends out where we live, and you know, here they here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> As it goes. Right. So anyway, my parents got in the car. They drove to Sydney. Yep. And um and and in the sixties, so this is fifty nine, so in the sixties they would go doing lots of club shows and all that sort of stuff, and then my brother started playing guitar, I guess, around sixty, sixty one, mm-hmm. when the shadows were big. Yep. Electric guitar, the mm-hmm. new instrument. Mm-hmm. And so he Hank would Marvin. Play. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Hank Marvin was a big influence on my brother. Yeah, right. And um so so I kind of, when I came along in 69, they'd sort of stopped doing the clubs and they were doing like more sort of churchy shows and old people's homes and all sorts of things like that. And so, and and by then my brother was 18 when I was born. So my brother was like, um, he had bands and he was right in there and this is the late 60s, early 70s. Mm-hmm. And we had people like Stevie Wright coming over and John I, English. Okay, and, so we, we haven't told the listeners who your brother is. So your brother is Stephen Housden, who um, would probably be most famous for Little River Band fame. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Yep. Right. He joined that band in 81. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah. All, so when I was a little, little boy, there'd be all these musos hanging around, rehearsing in the back room, and I wasn't allowed in the back room, but I could see them through the window. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. So that was kind of the backdrop to my very early years, um, like until I was about four, then he moved out and then, but my parents played and so they'd be like always rehearsing in the lounge room and I'd just wake up to them sitting there going through songs, mum mm. on the accordion singing, mm. dad singing, dad played the harmonica mm. and they'd like record themselves and, you know, that was their rehearsal time. Mm. And then we'd often go to shows and um, <clears throat> so that was all pretty sort of normal stuff, I guess, in my life. Uh-huh. And it didn't seem to be normal for anyone else around me. <laughs> there were no was other. That, oh, was that in, made known to you by people or, or is that just No, it was just a feeling, I guess, just yep. every other kid was sports fanatical uh-huh. and um, there didn't seem to be any music very little music other than in our house, you know. Okay. But there was plenty in our house. Right. And it, I guess, and there was a while there where I sort of got really into my bikes and I wasn't that interested in, I just didn't, wasn't, didn't even think about playing an instrument until I was about like nine or ten. And um, the first thing I remember that really happened was my brother took me to see the Who movie, The Kids Are Alright. Right. And um, and I didn't know what I was going to see. I just went to the cinema on a Saturday afternoon with my brother, you know. But I was like, whoa, what is this stuff, <laughs> you know. And so that really made an impression on me. And I, and I also remember seeing Monterey Pop Festival on TV. And I also remember seeing Hendrix on TV at Woodstock and just, right. and really, and I guess just joining the dots with, this is what my brother does, you know. He'd sort of come back and stay occasionally. Like if he was playing nearby, he'd maybe stay at our house. And, mm. 
you'd wake up and his guitar would be there, this really smoke-filled case. You yeah, know, right. in those days, yeah. everybody smoked everywhere. Yeah. And the smell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, which was what I associated with <laughs> being a musician, I guess. Yeah. And so, yeah, so there was a little bit of interest there. Um, and that must have been like 79, I guess. And then, and then in, and so around, so until, um, sorry, I'm jumping around a bit here, but Please do, in the seventies, my brother kind of played in Marsha Hines band and, right. and, um, did a lot of sessions and all this sort of stuff. Yep. But around the end of the seventies, him and his mate started this sort of more kind of new wave punky sort of influence band, which kind of went against the grain of everything that he'd sort of done with, with his muso buddies before, I guess, you know, and they were called the imports. Mm. And if I had a dollar for every dude that I've met that said, oh, I remember seeing the imports. Really? I'd, I'd probably be, I'd probably have a little more money. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. It's incredible. This band were around for like a year and they seemed to really make an impression on people. But, um. Was it the type of music or was it? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, they were pretty great players. They're pretty great musicians. My brother was just peaking. Like he's just. Right. Like I hear the tapes now, and I'm just like, "Wow, <laughs> it's just mind blowing." Yep. I mean, all the bands would like Mossy and those guys would, Barnsey would get up and sing with them, and you know, it was mm. it was sort of a big thing in that little underground kind of pub kind of way. Right. Um. I mean, this is all my take on it. Of course, because yep. I was ten then, I didn't go along and right. see them. However, so this band had started, and um, and then one day my my dad said, "Hey, we're going to see your brother play. You know, he's playing at the Horton Pavilion, supporting the Police." I said, "Who are the Police?" <laughs> <laughs> I always remember my dad sort of singing "Walking on the Moon" to me, right. which was like brand new then. So I just sort of went along on this family outing as I had done before, and. It just was like a light bulb moment and I just went, bang, that is what I've got to do. And so I got, so I, so I, for my birthday, I tried to get a guitar. Oh, I did get a guitar. I so asked do you, for a guitar. But do you remember like watching a Andy Summers or we, was not, it just the whole thing? Nah, it was just the whole thing. it was more thing. the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was definitely not like, you know, there's Andy Summers. I didn't know who Andy Summers was. Right. But one, but I guess... What did happen was it was recorded for Double J by Keith Walker. Right. Do you know Keith Walker? No, I don't. Oh, he worked for the ABC. And okay. He's a pal, but yeah. Okay, cool. I keep I keep finding these things where I go, I wonder if Keith Walker recorded oh, right. that, sure <laughs> enough. So, <laughs> That's cool. So they recorded that show and it was played on Double J, um, which was before Triple J, there was Double yep, J yep, on yep. AM. And, um, and I recorded it on my cassette and... You know, I certainly got very familiar with that live show. Like I would just play it to death okay. and listen. So then I became familiar with Andy Summers. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was sort of how it began. So was it, hey, shake, shake Dad by the arm, I need to get an electric guitar? It how, kinda, how do we make this happen? It, yeah, it kind of was. It was kind of like... Um, um, my, you know, okay, we'll get your brother to find you a guitar because he'll know what to look for. Yeah. Now, my brother found this little amp, an Evans amp, which I still have. But, he, but for the guitar, he was doing a session for this guy who he used to do a lot of stuff for. And he mentioned that he was actually meant to be out at this auction <laughs> to find his little brother a guitar. Oh, right. And this guy, John Gillard who did a lot of ads in those days, um, said, oh, I've got this guitar on the wall. Just here, you can have it. And he gave him this guitar. So he gave him this, like, Japanese no-name guitar, okay. yep. semi-acoustic guitar. Right. And that was my first guitar. Great. Do you still have it? I don't. So I really would wish I did. Yep. It's one of those things where you have something and then you try and get the next thing and then the next thing yep. the next thing and you've got to trade the first thing to get the next thing. But Yep. You can't keep everything. Yeah, that's it. Mm. So lessons straight away. Um, was your was your brother <coughs> so still around? 
Yeah. So, well, I mean, he 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 was still in Sydney at that stage. Yep. And so I guess I would have started lessons pretty quickly because my brother didn't live here. We didn't see my brother all the time because he'd like live in town and yep. you know yep. he had his own thing going. Mm -hmm. But then he then he joined. LRB mm -hmm. the following year, early the following year. Right. And then moved, went on tour to America for months and months and, yep. then, and then pretty much straight away moved to Melbourne. So my brother wasn't really sort of around, you know, giving me lessons. Okay. But when, he, when he'd visit, he'd give me the greatest little tips. Yep. And, um, and I think... You know, he'd say things like, he'd listen to me play and he'd go, work on your vibrato. And he'd say to me, you know, it's not about, you know, it's not about how you shake the neck, it's how your finger moves. And just little key things that, you know, really went into my head. Okay, right. work on my vibrato and it's moving my finger and not my, you know, don't shake the neck about it. It's nothing to do with the neck. It's where the string's going. Right. And all those little tiny things, like he would show me, tell me lots of little things like that, just now and again, every six months or whatever it was. Um, and that helped greatly, I think. Right. And I guess um, ha having, having a brother who played the way he does and was out there doing what he did, it was kind of like it seemed attainable somehow to be able to kind yeah. of... Well, if your brother's doing it. Yeah, if do he's it, doing yeah. it, well, I should be able to do it. Yep. But, you know, it was pretty high benchmark he set. Like I'd, mm. I had all these tapes of the imports mm. and, you know, it was really like it's it's inspiring now. Mm. It's just amazing, the playing on it. Yeah. Can I quickly tell you the, the, the story of how I first heard of your brother? Mm -hmm. Now, do you know the Ryland family? Oh. Billy Ryland, yeah. bass player? B Joella. Yeah, well, they used to come here yeah, you know, I thought they would. when I was a little baby. Yeah, Joella and I, we're... Same age within a couple of days. So you know Joella? Yeah. Um, my dad and Bill grew up together on the same street. They were neighbours. Is that right? Yeah, in Taito in New Zealand. Wow. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you have ever met Bill's older, uh, younger brother, Matt. I don't know if yeah, I've he met He might have Matt. come over. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I knew Matt before Bill in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, dad tra had tracked Bill down. Right. My dad, when he, yeah. dad came over here for a holiday yep. once. And Bill gave him this cassette tape of a whole bunch of demos that Bill had done. Right. And, and gave it to me to listen to. Right. And there was this one song in there with this fucking phenomenal solo on it. Yeah. It blew me away. And yeah. I still remember the song. I still remember the solo, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. And then I found out it was your brother Steve. Wow. And then once I found out it was him, then they told me that he was in Little River Band, and I'm right. like, oh, wow, that's cool. Huh. Yeah, wow. so that was the first time I'd heard of, of that's, Steve. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Small world. It is, yeah. 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 When my brother got married, they used to live in a half house. This is in about 77. They used to live yep. in a house that was like a half house. Right. You know, half yep. their house, half half Bill and Pam's house. Oh, is that right? And oh, the, right, okay. And the wedding reception, they they broke the door down. And opened the house, well, not broke it down, but you know, yeah, right. opened somehow opened up the divider, yeah, and turned the whole thing into one big yeah, party right. house, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> Bill, I think, played with Steve with um, Stevie Wright, yeah, Steve, yeah, yeah, and that's right, um, and also in Marsh's band for a little while, yeah, but he got let go. Right, I don't yeah. remember him in Marsh's band, but yeah, I, I'm not sure if he was there long. I'm, I'm not quite sure. They met Bill mm. by the, my brother either answered an ad or put an ad in the paper for a keyboard player for their band. Right. And this guy answered, and the guy was Garth Porter. And they eventually arranged... Oh, do you know who Garth Porter is? I've heard the name. He's from keyboard player from Sherbet. Oh, right, But he's yeah. also quite a famous, famous in his own right as a right. sort of producer in the country music scene. Right. And has a brilliant studio that... I've worked at quite a bit. Okay. Um, but he, but this is in about 1970 and they went and knocked on his door and uh, eventually met Garth and Garth said, oh, look, I've actually just joined this band called Sherbet. And, um, but here, meet my flatmate, Bill. Right. And Bill sort of introduced them to Stevie Wright and stuff. And right. Yeah. When the Rylands were living in Watson's Bay, they were living in Watson's Bay when we first came to 
Australia yeah. in 94. Right. And the bass player from Sherbet was living in the same building oh, as yeah. they were in, in yeah. Bay. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's yeah. the little that's the little backstory there. See, there's lots yeah. of little connections like know, you were man. saying, isn't and, it? And uh, I, I think I would have, I'm just trying to think how old I would have been when I first heard that tape. Maybe 17, 18. Wow. And yeah. just Bill's songwriting and his singing and his bass playing just, I, I just thought he was the greatest ever. Yeah. 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 And when I first met him, he picked us up because he was a taxi driver. Yeah. He wow. picked us up from the airport. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it's so cool to meet you, man. You know, I was like That's a little fan, great. you know. Yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, Steve's Steve's solo on that yeah. on that one track is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, back to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> it's fine. Um so yeah, so okay, so then so I I had lessons and I kind of blah 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 played and and was very very keen to be in a band and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. found it pretty hard to find people to play with then when I was 15 I kind of met up with some people who could play a guy named Rick Ballon who's a guitar player around Sydney mm-hmm. um, and we had a little band for a while and um, and then I joined a band called the riff which was the drummer in the riff is Sean, who runs Stage Door. Oh, really? Hustle. You know Sean? Right, yeah. Yeah. So that was when I was 15, just maybe 16 or whatever. Right. And, um, um, but then, uh, then I moved to Melbourne. Right. And the way I moved to Melbourne was just a chance thing where my brother happened to meet a guy named Craig Harneth who was in the band Kids in the Kitchen. Yep. Just happened to bump into him and got chatting and just mentioned how he had a little brother who was getting pretty good on the guitar and stuff. Mm. Craig just sort of put this in his memory bank and um, and when he got to Sydney on tour next, he just, he so he lived behind these guys in a band, that they're in this band called Charlie, and he lived behind them and to him he was like, they need a new guitar player. <laughs> when he got to Sydney... He looked me up in the phone book and um, rang me up and I was, my immediate reaction was, oh, no, I think you're looking for my brother, you know, because this guy from this famous pop band that I'd watch on Countdown is ringing me up, but mm. he's actually looking for me. And um, so he'd sort of, he'd sort of told me about this band and, you know, said you should come down and ha- audition for them and da, da, da. So I did. I, I went down, auditioned and it was great. So, Got sorry. in this band. So what about school? Oh yeah, that. Yeah, because you're fifteen, <laughs> sixteen. So yeah, it was I, like I left at fifteen. You left at fifteen. Yeah, right. I pretty much just knew what I wanted to do, and I didn't really plan on having a fallback plan. Oh, I just kind of, cool. I was like, "This is what I'm going to do." Going to go for it. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, well, it's mm. good for me. It's not good for everyone. Right. I wouldn't, you know, go recommending that, but <laughs> it was good for me. And it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Awesome. Yeah. Mm. So I'd kind of, I guess I'd been out of school about nine months and then I, and my my brother and his family lived in Melbourne. So I just thought, well, I'll go down and hang there for a while mm. and um, see how I go with this band. And so the band was really cool. Mm. The band, um, the singer was Adam Thompson, who later became... Famous for being chocolate starfish. starfish. Yep. Yeah. And who I'm still friends with. Cool. Um, and the drummer. Has he still got the hair? Uh, he's got the, no hair. Yeah, but he had the, the. I think he had some hair. Or the little tuft sticking out. Yeah, the he back doesn't there. have this tuft. Oh, okay. <laughs> but when I met him, he had hair. Yeah, right. <laughs> we all had lots of hair. <laughs> um, and the drummer was John Corniola, mm-hmm. who you probably know of. Do you know I of? know of Frank. Yeah. And, well, John Damien, so I'm not. Right. I'm sure with John. Is he the, a, a, another brother? John's Frank's brother. And, um, right. And John has played in Daryl Braithwaite's band since I started playing with Daryl, which we haven't really got to yet. We'll get there, yep. But, um, yeah, so John's a brilliant drummer and, um, you know, it was a great band to, to join at that age because they could play well. And they were really dedicated to. Right. How old were they? How old were those guys? They're a bit older. They well, John's about three years older than me, I think. So he's. I was 
I was 16, he was probably 19. Okay. And the other guys were sort of early 20s. And I think the keyboard player was 28, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was very contemporary 80s. Uh, that's what I was very into then. It was very like, there was a lot of sequences. Right. And the guitar was, my guitar style was quite different, I guess, to what people probably know me for now. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a lot more, um, well, I hadn't found my thing yet, I would yeah. say. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I don't think many people have at that age. Yeah. You know? No, of course mm. not. Yeah. But, um, yeah, anyway, that was the beginning of my Melbourne days. Mm -hmm. And so that went on for about a year and a half, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's like the longest year and a half in my life, though. Like oh, was that? Because so much happened, and I think when you're that age and you're evolving so quickly and so many new things are going on, mm. it's just like a big part of my life in my mind. Like, that's oh, what I, I mean. Oh, that's all I mean. Like I mean, I, 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 I mean, get that. I mean, yeah. like you know, a year and a half now is like you open a file on your computer and you go, "What? It's been two years since I opened that." Yeah, and it just seems like a flash. I gotcha. Yeah. So um, so that went on f f till about eighty seven, and then then I got asked to be in a Daryl Braithwaite film clip. Daryl Braithwaite had been famous in Sherbet, mm -hmm. but it had been quite a lot of years since he was, like, uh, since he'd made records, and this was like his first, first solo thing, was it? Yeah, it wasn't his first solo album, but it right. was like his, I guess you'd say, big comeback album. Okay, it's a funny term that. It's right. not a term that I use a lot. Right, but um, it kind of was. It was like a completely whole new image for him, and blah blah blah. Mm. So, through somebody that through a manager that kind of knew us in, in the band that I was in. The band was called Show of Hands, by the way. Mm -hmm. I think I said Charlie before. Yep. It was Charlie when I joined and then we changed, changed the name. name to Show of Hands. Mm -hmm. So um, a manager that knew those guys had, had remembered being, he asked me to be in this clip and that turned into a couple of years of playing with Daryl. So was that first clip, was that one summer? No, the first clip was As the Days Go By. Days Go By, right. And we, okay. did, we ended up doing another clip for that as well. There's two clips for that. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Yep. And, one, and the second one and the one summer clip were done about a year down the track. Right. Yeah. Um, so so how, did it, how did that gig come about? Like, Well, it came about in a, quite, in a strange way in that I got asked to be in this film clip and then... So how did that come about? Then? How, all that came about because this manager, manager oh, of right. Daryl had, right. had, um, had sort of known of me through, through show of hands. Oh, right. He'd like had some meetings with us and stuff. And right. Okay. He just remembered me. Right. So he was, they, was he going for a look, was he? Perhaps, yeah, probably just some young guys, you know. Right. Because I was young then. Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. 18. Yeah. And um, so he... He got me, he asked me to be in the clip. Right. Then he said to me, we're going to put together an audition band and the mm. audition band is going to learn all the songs or learn a bunch of songs and then one by one that person, each member will step out, each player will step out and we'll actually audition the real players that we want to get in the band. So that was the, huh. that was the process. Right. But what happened was pretty much we learnt the songs and then pretty much uh, most of us just ended up staying in the band. There was myself, there was Steve Morgan who was from Ice House, um, Lawrence Maddy on keyboards who'd been in, in No Nonsense, a sort of ska band in Melbourne. Um, and then I think I'd sort of, I and along with Steve Morgan who also knew John Corniola, suggested John for the drummer role. Right. And he came along and, and you know, blitzed it. And there he is, bless him, still playing with Daryl. Right, awesome. He's had a great run with Daryl. Yeah. 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 Um, um, so you didn't get to re record with Daryl? I didn't record with him, no, because... Mm. What the, about the other guys? What about... No, th those albums were kind of... 
uh, done, well, the first album was done before we knew even knew Daryl. So right. you know, we all went. We went on tour. We toured the album. We were all sort of hoping we'd get asked to do the next. Yeah, because I, I just mentioned to you before that. Yeah. Like the, um, one of my favourite all-time drumming albums. Yeah. Is Daryl Braithwaite's Rise with John yeah. Watson on drums. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just told me that was basically the whole James Rain. Band. It was. Yeah. Right? It was basically right. Watto and Andy Sishon on bass, and I think the guitar player was Jeff Scott. Mm-hmm. And the producer of those Daryl albums, I think, I think it was James's brother-in-law. I think he was married to James' sister, maybe. Okay. okay. Um, so, yeah, at the time it was a little, we were all hoping we'd get asked yeah. for this album. Yeah. But having gone on and made records and all that, you know, I hadn't made records then, so. Uh, okay. You know. So they, they wanted so to ha- the tried and true type. Well, ha- having sort of done that now, I kind of get it. Like the producer yep. just goes, these are my guys. Sure. And I know how to communicate with them and I know they can deliver. Mm. And that's a pretty important thing if you're producing a record, you know. Yep. You don't, you know, it's you're taking a risk by getting the unknowns. Because, mm. you know, it's one thing to be able to play on stage and it's another thing to be able to play in the studio. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So when did the when did the Daryl <coughs> thing wrap up? Um, was it a graduation? A, 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 a gradually, well, or, or did once the Rise album came out? Did you guys tour so, the Rise album? No, nah, I okay. didn't. I okay. I um. So the the side part of this story is that on the first at that first video clip, I met Michael Spivey, who would become the singer in the Bad Loves. Mm-hmm. And um, Michael sort of toured the guitar, the other guitar role. So Michael toured with Daryl a bit as well. Mm-hmm. Him and Chuck Hargraves, who'd been in the Uncanny X Men, mm-hmm. were both toured with, as you know, swapping here and there right. <laughs> for that couple of year period. Yep. And but Michael was a um, a songwriter and a singer, mm-hmm. and he knew that that's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to be a guitar player in a band as such. And um, his time with Daryl was sort of, I guess as mine was really, it was sort of like we'll go and do it for a while and, you know, have a bit of fun, experience the world. See what happens. As a touring musician, you know. Yep. Um, And so I'd met Michael that day and gotten to know him and then during that time he'd kind of gotten, he was kind of writing his songs and demoing and all this sort of stuff. And really, I guess, around that time when Daryl was probably recording Rise, that's Mm. when we'd sort of started the Bad Loves. Right. And so my memory of it is that we we weren't really playing with Daryl and the Bad Loves had just sort of begun, like we were rehearsing in this shed for quite a few months and then yep. eventually did a gig mm. and this is like 1990 and then Daryl's album came out probably late toward the end of 1990 mm-hmm. and we did the record launch when I say we I did the record launch right. with, the, with his band yep and um and that was kind of the last thing that I did I think I I don't know how it came about that I didn't tour but I know that I kind of sort of chose not to tour because mm. I knew that I wanted more than to just be a touring guitar player and I was really enjoying this whole thing with the Bad Loves. Right. Because along, along the way here, I, I know before I said I was a very sort of contemporary 80s guitarist, mm-hmm. but during my time, I guess, during my time with Daryl, I'd really discovered a lot of older records and just been completely seduced by the 60s, Hendrix, um, and I'd, I'd always sort of had a little foot in that area. Mm-hmm. I'd been really into the Beatles always, but it was kind of like the Beatles are in their own universe in a way. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. Like kids now love the Beatles, but that doesn't mean they love 60s music. They yep. just know the Beatles. Cause I it's understand. Just, yep. Yeah. So, um, so when I, I went on tour to Europe and I started, I bought a CD player, first CD player, and I'd buy these CDs and I bought Axis Boulder's Love and that just like, blew my mind, changed my life. Mm. And I just got fascinated by how how different it all sounded, how the production, the productions, you know, sounded so different to mm. what we were doing then in the 80s with yep. music where yep. everything was so metronomic and precise. And yep. 
you know, and I and it really sort of, yeah, I just reinvented myself, I guess. And and that and so this ties in because the bad loves are obviously for anyone that may be listening that knows of the bad loves, <laughs> <laughs> or would know that they were pretty earthy sounding band in a time where music yep. wasn't necessarily like that. Music on the radio wasn't like that. Yep. And um, and I guess Michael Michael was very into older music, particularly sort of soul music and all that sort of stuff. And so it all fed in with my fascination with this older music. Right. Meeting him and him sort of being into that and turning me onto things. And, yep. you know, it all sort of tied in. And the idea of going on tour playing contemporary 80s pop music as a guitar player mm. kind of, you know, I was 20 then and I knew that I wanted to do something else. Mm-hmm. Mm. But I'm very fond of my time playing with Daryl. Yeah. And I love yeah. bumping into him. and That's cool. I got on stage with him a couple of months ago and it was really cool. Oh, great. Where was yeah. that? At, um, I think Wagga. Wagga. Yeah, right. Had a big sort of show. That I was part of, yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Now, when you first heard that that uh, Transformation album, yeah. right, what what did you do at that point to go about what, seeking that sound? Did you have, as, did as you a, think, you, yeah, like. As a guitar as player. As a guitar player, yeah. Did, did you have, did you think you had the gear to be able to pull that off or did you go, oh, no, I'm <laughs> going to have to go and. Well, no. Buy some stuff. Yeah, I, I, no, I basically trashed everything I had. I trashed my whole concept. I had this. Yeah, like, right. Okay. I had like rack gear. And yep. It was all MIDI together. Right. And I'd go. I mean, you know, it's common now, but it probably wasn't that common then. But yep. it'd be like this bank is this song, and these are the sounds for yep. this part. And and uh, I just started rethinking it, like. You know, the sound of the guitar, at that point, I'd still was like, I would play with the guitar volume on full all yeah. the time. Because yeah, right, just rely on your patches sort of, and... Yeah, yeah, and change all that stuff. And then I started thinking about it and thinking, but they didn't do that in those days, and how did they do it? And then, you know... They used so, this thing called Dynamics or... Dynamics. Or something. <laughs> See, it was... <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I kind of did. I kind of trashed all that stuff mm. and got, I'd sort of started getting older stuff and exploring the possibilities and getting into tube gear. And I got, I got, for a while there, I had a transistor amp and I went back to a tube amp. And then I started just using all this stuff and using the volume on my guitar and the tone on my guitar mm. and all the different things and trying to basically get the sound that I wanted without lots of stuff and with nothing programmed right? and just kind of think, how did people do it in those days? Right. And, you know, I've sort of since realised that if you listen to a lot of the live stuff, well, people didn't in a way, like they weren't really getting the same sounds that were in the studio. Um, so it, it was all a bit of a compromise, but, you know, mm. um, but yeah. That is what I did. Mm. Um, I was, uh, well, this morning, actually I sent your brother a message. Did you? Yesterday, yeah. Yeah. And um, said that I was talking to you and, and asked him if he had a bit of insight. And one thing he wrote. Yeah. Um, hang on, let me just find it here. And this is, this is Rick, you're about three years old. Right. And Steve had a two-track recorder. Yeah. yeah. And he used to bounce tracks and stuff and he had this way of developing this tape echo sound yeah. and he said that what they did with you one day is they gave you a microphone and headphones <laughs> with this tape echo and you just you just knocked this thing out you were on this thing for ages so I started thinking <laughs> with that, having that kind of sound in your head maybe it's kind of uh, starting to embed itself so uh, yeah it's fascinating eh no mm. I think it is what I think is, it's interesting that you mentioned that, and it mm. makes me immediately think how, at school in my head, I'd be I'd be tapping my teeth together. Yep, the teeth, my teeth together was the snare drum. Yep, like from a really early age, like 
I guess from hearing my brother rehearsing in the house mm -hmm. so much, it was just like that the, gr the rock beat <laughs> yeah, was embedded. And so I think those things do, if you're exposed to that, yeah. it really does Im embed in your head, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting he'd say that. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was interesting when I read that. Mm. Um, yeah, okay, so the bad loves. Mm. Um, when did they start getting a bit, bit of interest? Did you have to kind of shop it? Yeah. How did it kind of work? Uh, we kind of had these managers that were that were pretty into it. The sort of mentors, man, loose management arrangement situation. Um, and we would write and we'd demo. And so around then I got I I got myself four track and mm -hmm. I had kind of I had kind of done demos when I was a teenager and written, but for some reason I just hadn't for a while, you know. But yep. then when that band started, I was like, right, gotta write songs, you know. Mm -hmm. And um and so we'd all do this, we'd all just demo these songs and write and and um we eventually ended up with a um a reel of about I think twenty five or thirty songs. And I guess around I guess ninety two, I think, we signed to Mushroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, people weren't it wasn't like the people were knocking down the door, but Mushroom got interested and could see mm. something there, you know. Is that Gadinsky? Yeah. Mushroom? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Gadinsky. And so and we used to play at this gig, the station hotel in Paran and in Victoria and um and that had been a real hang in the seventies, and Gudinski, I think, had sort of seen lots of bands there, and then right. then he sort of came to see us or something. Knew that we played there. Okay, cool. <laughs> sort of tied in somehow because we were quite seventies sounding, you know. Okay. Um, but I'm sure they weren't signing us, thinking these guys are seventies. We're going to sign them. They were kind of hearing the songs and the way we put it together. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. So I think we signed around early '92, and probably started recording our first record around then, around late 92, came out in 93, mm -hmm. and um, and kept doing gigs, mm. all that sort of stuff. We used to play at the SB Front Bar in Melbourne. Do you know the SB in Melbourne? No. It's a pretty famous gig in St Kilda. Right. It's just been all remodelled and it's right. very, very zhuzhy now. With very, you know I've never very, been to Melbourne? Wow. Yeah. Really? Waiting for someone to invite me. Oh, man. Yeah. No, La just kidding. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, folks, <laughs> folks of the pod world. No, no. There's <laughs> invite this man to Melbourne. No, no, there's, there's lots of people I'd like to talk to down in Melbourne. So, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. i got to get down there. Oh, you've got to get down to Melbourne. It's yeah. a brilliant town. Yep. It's cold as shit. Yeah. <laughs> From New Zealand, man, it's not that cold. Yeah. Can't be that cold. No, it's... Um, now classy. the the recording session for that first album. Now mm. um, I was listening to that album in the car on the way here. Oh yeah. Mm. Um, were they tracked mostly live? Yeah. Yeah. Good chunk of it. Mm. I mean, yeah, it was all. So our thing was that we we wanted it to be sort of old sounding. Yeah. I mean, I was really, you know, a big mouthpiece for that. Okay. <laughs> um, and we would. We'd sort of would demo with people, and they just kind of. No one was really that into doing that idea, that style of recording, until we met Doug Roberts, who ended up recording it, and he was the guy that kind of went, "Yeah, I'd give it a go." Mm. And so we were, we, yeah. So we were serious about tracking it as live as possible, yep, and not having massive drum sounds with massively yeah. compressed rooms and yep. like that big yeah, <laughs> yeah. we just certainly not that yeah. little sneaky little 70s sounds you know that's what we were into yep and um and Doug really just went for it and and um yeah so i mean fa fairly live but nothing there's nothing on there that's just totally live yep except maybe the last is the last track maybe spirit in the sky that's just a piano and vocal yeah yeah, I mean that probably was the two of them just playing. And but in terms of the band tracks, we tracked all the stuff live, and then we'd sort of add bits and mm -hmm. occasionally replace some bits. Mm. Yeah, mm. Um, I told you when I first got here, um, when I first came to Australia in ninety four, end of ninety four. Mm. You guys are pretty big at that stage, mm. um, all over the radio and 
mm. Hey Hate Saturday. And yeah. Just, just, yeah. So that that's how I came to yeah. Yeah, know of the Bad Loves, and then, um, and then your se- second album. Yeah. Um, so, you did you tour um, worldwide? Well, when I say worldwide, did you go overseas? <laughs> we did. Yeah. We uh, so we toured extensively in Australia. Yep. Including a, a tour with Lenny Kravitz that was oh cool pretty super yeah I loved it how's he ah uh, he was great yeah. yeah it was like right when he was making those first the third album had just come out and, right you know it was cool yeah. it was really good awesome um and then we did a tour of Europe like yeah chunks of a chunk of Europe with supporting Jimmy Barnes and um that was really cool and then. Then three of us went back to Europe a little while later and did like a radio sort of tour, mm-hmm. radio station tour. Yeah, and um, yeah, then we kind of then it was the classic thing of all right, you've had three years to get your first record together. Here's six weeks, write a new album. Oh right. And um, you know, I guess if we were really together, we would have been just writing along the way, but we kind of weren't. Yeah, right. And, you know, just enjoying the trip. It's kind of hard. You get on the road and it's hard. Like I toured this year with Tim Minchin, like a big 10-week tour. Yeah. And, man, I had big plans and yeah, right. of what I was going to do on my downtime. And right. it just didn't happen because it just there's just a lot going on on, tour, on certain, yeah. certain tours, you know. Yeah. There's lots going on and it's really hard to go, okay, I'm going to step away from that now and do yeah. what I came here to do. And yep. Yeah, anyway. Um, so, yeah, so we toured, so, yeah, so then we got into working on this second album. Mm-hmm. First one had done well, so we thought we were kings. Right. I'm saying this kind of I, I know half jokingly, but, yep. you know, we, like, the first album we wrote in a shed, second album we are in Sing Sing Studios, block booked for six weeks. Right. <laughs> to, right. To sort of rehearse these songs that were half written. Right. And when I think back about that now, I just go, whoa, that's like just thousands of dollars spent yeah set up so luxurious yeah can't right. imagine doing that now mm. but anyway that's what we did it didn't seem luxurious then it just seemed the norm mm. yeah were you going for that because there's de- definitely a, a, a change in the sound yeah, yeah. so i know was that, that was that I, uh was that um what's the word i'm looking for conscious conscious yes thank you i don't think it was necessarily conscious i i think um, part of the thing was that the first album had been, the songs had been played lots live and mm. developed mm. and, you know, the songs had a chance to develop and you kind of find the ones that work as a band and resonate with an audience and all those sort of things. Second one, we did nothing like that. So you kind of sit there and you write a song on your guitar and it is a good song or it can be a good song, yep. but it doesn't mean it's going to kind of translate to a band setting or to an audience in the same way that perhaps a song that you've kind of written and then evolved with the band and all that, developed with the band and all gotcha. that. Um, so I guess with that album we ended up with all these songs and then we sort of voted which is the best song, the best song, the best song. And, you know, we may have chosen the best songs, but... For me, it's less cohesive and less of a whole package. Mm -hmm. It's just like... So the sound is different probably because we said these are the songs that stand out as songs. Yep. Sort of taught... It it taught me that I think with an album, you kind of want to have an album that's an album and sometimes the lesser songs work better in the big picture of that album. Yeah, because you talked about the first album, there not being that... Yeah, that compressed drum sound and mm. but like the song um Slave, yeah. it definitely has that. Especially on the drums. Well, well, it has a lot of compression, mm. but it's still bone dry. Yeah. It's right. not okay, and that and that compression actually um it's interesting you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, cool. It's still a very dry sound. Right. You know. Yep. But it is quite compressed, I guess. Yeah. And yep. at the time I thought it was really cool and exciting. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. But um, but that was mixed by Jack Joseph Pug in 
LA. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. And that sort of came about because we we mix it here and kind of didn't we weren't jumping up and down about it and then our manager I think suggested why don't we just get someone else to mix it from scratch, someone that has that had nothing to do with it. Mm. So that immediately um changed it, doubled the budget. Yeah, right. And <laughs> <laughs> all those things. Um, so what other stuff was he doing at the time? Well, he'd just done the Black Crows Amorica oh, album, right. which we were kind of, I, I wasn't so much into that one, but I, was, I loved the one before it, the Southern Harmony musical companion. It's a very cool album. Mm. But Amorica, you know, he just, it's still sort of, I guess Amorica quite has that similar compressed sound, doesn't yeah, it? You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Our keyboard player used to say it's a lesson in compression. Lesson in compression, right. <laughs> if someone <laughs> says, what does a compressor do? Put Holly Roadside on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, now, did you... Not, okay, so this album comes out. Yeah. What was the expectation? Well, I think the, I think the reaction was possibly a bit like you're having right now. You're saying... It's very different. Was it conscious to be different? Mm. And I think, you know, in some ways, yeah, I, I, it didn't, the reaction was not as great as the first one. Yeah. And I can kind of dig that because the first one had a thing and I don't think the second one had as much of a thing. Right. And I think we did some things that weren't maybe ideal, like the first single we released is a full-on acoustic song mm. and suddenly we're all sort of wearing suits playing acoustic guitars in our clip. Right. And... I don't know. I, you did, we didn't. It wasn't really a conscious shift at the time. Mm -hmm. Totally, I don't think. But in hindsight, yeah, it was a bit of a strange move. Mm. <laughs> hindsight, yeah. Hindsight, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, did the feeling start to change in the band that you kind of um, lost lost the spark, so to speak? Well, yeah. It sort of. I guess it's a, it sort of became a bit of a. Then we did this live album. We did a live album, which, I don't know, it's a funny representation of us, but, mm. um, but yeah, I guess, I don't know. It's kind of hard to remember. Oh, so around then I moved back to Sydney. That yep. was yep. one. My dad got sick and I kind of came back mm -hmm. and then sort of stayed here. So I guess that was a bit of a... Possibly a bit of a factor, but you know, okay. bands still function with members in different cities all yep. the time. Yep. But yeah, I think the first thing that happened, I started then writing all these songs. Like I got back to Sydney and I just started writing all these songs and they were nothing like the Bad Loves okay. at all. Right. And um, yeah, and then I sort of decided I sort of wanted to do a record and all this sort of stuff. And then, and then Michael, the singer, decided to do a record and... And the, and basically we were sort of, it was presented that Michael's going to do this record and we're going to take a year off. Mm -hmm. And that was essentially the end of the band. Okay. You know, we've reformed since then, but mm -hmm. the um, the wheels fell off, I think, you know. Yeah. When that happens, when, you, when you've got something up and running and, and, uh, and you stop, it's, mm -hmm. everyone just goes off and does their, their own thing. Yeah. And you come back and you're like different people. Yeah, right. So that's kind of what happened. Yep. Mm. Mm. So back in Sydney, um, mm. you starting to play with some other people? Well, Were you starting to do sessions and? Well, I wasn't. I wasn't really. Not much. Not mm. yet. Like I, I kind of started recording and learning how to record. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I bought I bought a hard disk recorder, new technology then, mm. <laughs> yeah. and just set up my little studio and just like kind of immersed myself in that yep. and I'd play around a little bit, sort of jam a bit with people and play a bit, um, but I kind of focused on writing my songs and recording them and learning how to record them mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that really sort of taught me how to play in a, in a situation, in a session situation where you're playing, you're not, you're not in there in, a, in the live room with your mates playing the songs that you know well yep. all together, mm -hmm. you're kind of creating a part on the spot yep. and locking it in with the track yep. and getting it to sit right. And, um, you know, 
so I, I kind of spent a bit of time doing that. And, um, and then, then I did start playing a little bit. Mm -hmm. I went on tour with Kate Sobrano. Mm -hmm. So this is now around like 99, I guess. I went on tour with Kate and played a bit with Christine Anu. And then Tim Friedman rang me up, Tim Friedman from the Whitlam's. And he had actually rang me before once and I'd said, no, nah, no, I'm busy recording my stuff. But I didn't really know who the Whitlam's were. And <laughs> like, they were just like another band that floated around. So right. I didn't really think about it too much other than I just sort of remembered he'd mentioned that to me. Mm. Oh, then I went and played, I played on their record. So I did do some sessions with them and I guess I did bits of sessions here and there. Mm -hmm. And I play on Love This City album a bit. Mm -hmm. And I started doing sessions for my friend Daniel Denham, who I still work with frequently and um, have done, had a great relationship with Daniel, I guess, for over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Daniel was working on that album and um, on the Love This City album. And so I did some tracks on that and then like... And Terrapai played on that, didn't he? Yeah, so Terrapai... Had you met him before? Before that? Uh, I'd done, yeah, with Daniel, Terrapai and I had both done sessions for Daniel. Okay. We worked, we played with Diana Arnaid. Yeah. Um, with Daniel producing. And so, yeah, Terrapai had sort of did that album as a session drummer. Mm. And then it was kind of after that album that he got asked to be in the band. Yep. And then they toured for a while. Then I got asked to be in the band. And, cool. And then I thought, all right, I'm going to see what this is about now. <laughs> Having done some sessions with them. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it was a funny, a funny little experience at first because, like, Tim has this, um, he had this house down the south coast and they'd be set up there. And, and the Whitlam's as a rehearsal band is really funny. Like, it's, it's as far the opposite from our live shows as you could possibly imagine. So, like, the live shows really kick. Like, mm. they really, you know, we just go for it. Yep. Pie just is like having a, um, you know, a big machine behind you, mm. a sensitive, big sensitive machine that mm. picks up on what everyone else is doing and yep. plays sympathetically to them whilst still kicking you in the ass somehow, you know. Yep. It's pretty amazing. But rehearsals, it's like just, it's like just sitting around on the couch, nobody, people <laughs> half playing. And so I'd go and rehearse with this band. I'd be like, what is this band about? And, and I didn't really know all the songs. I knew some of the songs, but there was lots I didn't know. Mm. And then, um, so I'm learning all these songs and then the first gig's coming up and I get on stage at the first gig and I just didn't know what it hit me. It was just like packed room, people just squashed up right to the front. Right. Because I'm right in the centre. <laughs> people are like, you know, a metre away from me. Right. Singing every word to all these songs and Pi is just like going for it, you know. Yeah. And it was just like, whoa. And that is what it's like. It's like that every time we play. Yep. It's amazing. Mm. Can you tell I really love playing with yeah. these guys? <laughs> a big smile on your face. <laughs> yeah, I really do. I just love it. I really love I love it, yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of the irony is um, it's such un-guitar music, I guess, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But right. – Because but obviously very piano-based. Yeah, it is. Mm. But, you know, it's the, the music – the music carries it, you know. The yeah. music is the important part, yeah. not the yeah. – Guitar factor. Yeah, incredible song. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. So any um, future albums with Whitlam's, do you think? Um, we haven't done an album for 13 years yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Tim has actually been writing some songs. Okay, cool. And um, that's big news. Mm. So I don't know. Are you know. allowed to share that here? Well, this... Because uh, this goes I, out to millions. Yeah, look, there's going to be at least several hundred or thousand of those millions that are going to go to Tim's shows at yeah, for sure. in, in the next couple for of sure. months. We, we've he, got tickets. To, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, you know, he is doing a run of shows and he's promised to play some new songs and so he's been writing the new songs. Great. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure I can share that. Cool. Yeah. 
as for the rest, I don't have any idea. I don't know if we were record or what. I don't know. Yep. Mm. Yep. Um, mm. And you guys um, came off your 20-year anniversary tour last year, is that right? Yeah. 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 When I when I spoke to Terabai, yeah, um, it was the night. It was the day after you guys had done a corporate gig for a couple of tech guys in Sydney, because the wife liked the Whitlam, so they I hired. I'd, they hired you guys. To, I think I maybe didn't do that gig. Oh right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes those little gigs happen. Oh, I, I think I was somewhere else. Oh, right, okay. And I, I think I remember I listened to Terrify's thing and he was mentioning that and I think okay. I was yeah. thinking, oh, yeah, that was, I couldn't do that gig or something. Yeah, right, okay. You know, very yeah. occasionally they'll, they will do that. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, so the Whitlams obviously don't take up most of your year unless you're on a tour, I guess. Yeah. So what's sort of filling those gaps? Well, lots of little bits and pieces. Um. I, I've done many interesting little things <laughs> in the last little while. Yeah. Like this year, for instance, I began the year by playing the Red Hot Summer Tour with Richard Clapton. Mm -hmm. Then I went on tour with Tim Minchin for about 10 weeks, which mm -hmm. involved rehearsals leading up to that, right. et cetera, mm -hmm. and played theatres, like the State Theatre. We did like eight State Theatres and eight Palais Theatres in Melbourne. It was a big tour. Wow. And, um, and... Did, then you, I, did you do the Opera House stuff as well <clears throat> with him? Um, the first time I played with him was in 2015 at the Opera House for sure. So I know I know he's done some Opera House stuff in the concert Inside, hall. yeah. Yeah, I didn't do this stuff. Uh, oh, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, what happened then? Then I went... Then the Whitlams went on tour. Yep. That was how long? About six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I also do... So one of the things that I've been doing, which I really love in, for about the last four years, is um, these retro kind of shows called Classic Hits or Pure Gold Live. Yep. And they involve about 10 or 12 acts, and I'm the MD of the house band. So, oh, cool. So in a day, there might be like 12 bands, and maybe three or four of those will be self-contained bands mm -hmm. and the rest will be house band acts. And um, and so the, the acts we're talking about are people like um, Steve Kilby from The Church does it, Richard Clapton sometimes does it, um, the Eurogliders, Swanee, lots of big 80s acts, you know. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and I kind of love it because it's... It's like sort of being on the set in Countdown, on, on Countdown when I was Yeah, a kid. right. Yeah, that, that's People cool. I used to watch. That's cool. So that's, so that's fun. So we, do, we maybe do like about seven of those a year. Right. And it's a really cool band with Dario on bass, sometimes Victor on bass, mm -hmm. and Gordon Rittmeister on drums, and, um, and my wife Robin sings BBs. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I do that a bit of, in the year. Yep. Um, and... Throughout the year, I should say. Yep. Um, in recent times, I've done album. I've did, did the latest Steve Kilby album. Mm. Played guitar on it. Yeah. When I say did, mm -hmm. um, I did the latest Glenn Shorrock album, playing lots of stuff that I used to hear my brother play. Yeah, that's yeah. cool, man. It's pretty psychedelic. Yeah. I mean, psychedelic concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of. It was quite funny, like because it's an album of LRB songs. Yep. So I sort of, the way my brother performed those songs is embedded in my head. Right. And, um, and you, you try and stay true to that? I did in certain places. Yeah. But I think, like, the album was not really just let's redo those songs as they were. It was kind of our own angle on it, which was a bit earthier and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I definitely had to do a little psychological recalculate in places of how do I do this being true to how I've heard, how I grew up with it, hearing my brother play it yeah. versus hearing the seventies records before my brother was in it right? versus the, the way I play now 
as me. Right. <laughs> right. And there were, it was an interesting, definitely psychologically different to any, any other thing that I've done. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. Yeah. So how did that come about? Um, Glenn does the shows, the, the shows that I mentioned, the retro oh, blog right. shows. Okay. He does those. So I've sort of gotten to know Glenn, re-gotten to know. I, knew, I mean, I sort of knew him a little when I was a kid. Yep. Um, yeah, gotten to know him again. And, um, and then this album came up and my friend, my good friend Steve Balby produced that album. And, um, and so he suggested me and Glenn was into that and away we went. I played yeah. with Steve Balby. Did you? It was only for about 60 seconds. but <laughs> <laughs> We did a benefit concert. Well I, well, I was in the band I was playing at the time, my covers band. We were, yeah. we were the band. Yeah. And um, we're doing a benefit concert for um, a friend of ours that was, uh, had lung cancer. Right. And it was out at the Cube at Campbelltown. Yeah. And Steve was one of the guests. And he got up solo. Yeah. And started playing some songs, and then he just sort of wanted a bit of crowd participation, so he started clapping something out, and then he called for the drummer to come up. And right. So I ran up, jumped yeah. behind the drums, and yeah. just basically just played a kick drum through one of his songs. You know, so that was. I can see that. Yeah. Very clearly in yeah. my mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> what, you would, what, uh, what you wouldn't have seen, I mean, because Steve's obviously got his look. Yeah. But the band I was playing in, it's a beach band. Right. So I'm in a Hawaiian shirt. So I bet you didn't see that, eh? <laughs> I didn't see that bit, but I can see the Steve part. Yeah, yeah. Of getting the crowd involved. And, yeah, yeah, it was cool. Yeah, yeah, he's so incredibly good at at um doing that. Yeah. Just yeah. taking an audience on a journey. He was fantastic. You know? He's really cool. very, he really has a, a gift for it. Yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah. back to the... Yeah, so that so I did that album uh, with Steve producing, and yep. and I play with Steve as well. I play in his band. Cool, and um, and yeah, we we do a bit of stuff together. Yeah, we're, we're good pals. Mm. Um, and what else? The uh, Easy Beats thing. The Easy Beats thing. Yeah, that was awesome. So yep. I worked on the ABC biopic of the Easy Beats. And um, I first of all got asked to be to record the music, so we had to re-record a lot of the songs, so right. they could then access the separate tracks and all that sort of stuff. Right. And so I did that with Wayne Connolly producing, and then they were looking for a a tutor for the actors, and they asked Wayne, and Wayne suggested me, thankfully, and I loved it <laughs> because That's great. so I'd get up at like. Six in the morning, mm. and I'd pick two Easy Beat songs, and I'd just sit there trying to decipher the very intricate guitar parts from a mono mix <laughs> right. and work out That's who cool, was man. doing what and watch YouTube and try and figure out where their fingers were and just get an angle on what to show these guys who, so the two guitar players could play guitar, um, but they're they're primarily actors. They're not mm. guitar players, but they do play guitar. So, but the bass player, who I also tutored, had never, he plays piano, but he'd never held a bass. So, right. so day one, he's like holding the bass. <laughs> and he just, he applied himself and he went for it. And he just stood there like Dick Diamond playing all those runs. You know, he just practiced. So, I, yeah. So, and then I ended up on the set as well for all the music scenes. Um, as the music supervisor. And so that was a super gig because it falls right into, covers much ground of of uh, the things that I love, the 60s and, you know, being on a period piece film set and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It was really great. Mm. Mm. That's really cool. And, and it, it came out before we get well. to the, Before yeah. we get to the, um, the to mention stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated in the recording process. Always have been. Yeah. I told you that yeah. I recorded my EP last year. So I just I was yeah, interesting to know your your recording process. Yeah. Um for myself, for yourself, yeah. Because uh I we haven't really spoken about that, but yeah. I do mm. other than me saying I kind of learnt to 
record on my own and stuff. But yeah, right. I am. I'm like I'm quite a keen recordist and songwriter, and I'm currently working on my record, which I'm about to put out soon. That's I'm going to put a single out in December. Yep, and do a launch in London. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I've been working away on that and yeah, my my process. So um, let, let me, mm. what I mean by process mm. is, I mean, you know, there's all these different ways to record. It's all, you can either go all in the box, mm. outboard gear, combination of both. Um, some people are very strict on wanting it to be all outboard. Mm. Some people want it to all be in the box. Um, we would we were talking a little bit about it before before we went yeah. to air. Yeah, just interesting to know your what your approach to it is. Do you hear well, a sound in your head, and is it yeah whatever it takes to get that sound? Yep, yep, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I've the sound. Well, for the music I'm doing right now, and that I love, like I've, it's very sixty sounding, mm-hmm. and you know, I've listen to those records for many many years and mm-hmm. really just thought and re- thought about how they recorded music in those days mm-hmm. and what it was that made it sound like that and read about it and mm-hmm. explored it and da 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 um my, i guess but i don't think there's any one way to do anything yeah but i have learnt that it begins by getting your drums to sound right as the drum kit right <laughs> and you know, um, ideally record them in the room that you want them to be in, and that's definitely not the case with all of my music. I've right. definitely got tracks where it's like, oh, why did I do it in that room? And you know, you it's not as flexible when you are trying to when you're trying to get that sort of sound where it's one overhead mic and a kick drum mic, yeah. pretty much. You kind of that's the sound, and there's less manipulation you can do. Right. Compared to close miking everything and gotcha. being able to change stuff, um, but I don't. I mean, I don't. I've sort of. I have gone the route of analog tape machines, digital desks in the box, out the box, all these things. And when I began recording songs, you know, and I and I first bought a drum kit and all that, I mm. just had an eight track analog machine and I'd sit there with that beside me and go yep. bang and then I'd bounce those tracks down to a stereo pair and yep. um but now I feel like that that I've always been chasing a sound and have never been able to get it. But I feel like the technology has caught up <laughs> to what I'm trying to do in a oh, way. That's cool. So I use yeah. the technology. Uh, I use all the available technology, the plugins. Yeah, great. All those things. Yep. Um and what I've, what I think is that it's so much about um, it. The the end result comes from the person. So the way you play into things, the what you know, the vision you have for something to sound, the way you want it to sound, it's kind of gonna have that, you know, that sound. Because mm-hmm. that because you're the guy driving, you're the guy pressing the buttons, moving yep. the sliders, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, I, f- I feel like the, there's a lot of great technology now and I'm and I'm not sort of really hung up on it being all analog and everything. I think I think that's sort of the icing on the cake. Yeah. And and in my experience, um you even if you've got that technology, it's a person that's driving it and yep. <laughs> what you do with all that stuff that makes it what it is. Yep. And yeah, I think it's I think that's the main thing, really. Mm-hmm. Sort of th- within limit. I mean, within reason. Yeah. I, <laughs> okay. I know what you're saying. <laughs> so, like, if I was plugging into, if I was playing my guitar through some crap plugin as an amp with latency, right, and not really getting a great sound, that would be pretty shit. It would be. I would shit. never do that, right? Yeah, you wouldn't do it. Yeah. And like, but right now, like, I've always mic'd my amps. I mean, if you want to get really technical, I've okay. always like mic'd my amps. But now I've got this U, this new UAD thing called the Ox, which is which comes out of your speaker output, and it's an emulator, speaker emulator. And I'm sure there's going to be loads more of this stuff, but it coming out soon. But yep. you know, for me, 
um, it's brilliant because now I just I've been using that and that's using new technology, but it's still all my gear right to that point. It's just that little speaker part that's different. Yeah, and just you know, there's no latency. It feels like you're playing through it through you know in a room with your amp in a room, and it's just brilliant. So, right. so yeah. There's a little ad for UAD, for you, for Universal, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to your millions of listeners. Yeah, yeah. Um, but thing, you know, things like that are really. Yeah. I think, like, I would not want to split hairs over that and go, "Oh, it's not pure." Oh, okay. You know that, what I that's mean? That's what I was getting because it's yeah. kind of like for me, it's like the the sound is going to come from my fingers and my imagination, yeah. Yeah. and that's where it comes from. Awesome. Yeah, mm. and you know, the the that is the tiniest final little piece. Right. Of the puzzle. Are you still chasing guitar tones? Do you mm. think you have your you think you have your sound now? I think I I think I do. I mean I, I mm-hmm. think what I think is that I don't get too hung up on it really. Like, I mean I think the sound again, it comes from the person. Yep. And I learnt this really early on from my brother. Yeah, cool. Inadvertently by him trying out new gear and going, you've got to hear this, come over. And and again, it's like it's the icing on the cake, but the sound is my brother playing. Yep. And it always sounds like my brother playing. Mm. And I think it's kind of the same with me. It, so- it, sounds, like, it sounds like the person, you know. Yeah. So in terms of the tone, no... I don't really, I mean, I kind of, I have kind of used, on stage, I've essentially used the same guitars, amp, I use the cheapest guitar. Um, yeah, right. Like, they just happen to be cheap, but they're good. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, like, at the same amp and the same tube pedal, my tube pedal is important to me, and maybe if I didn't have that, I don't know, I'd pr- probably adapt to something else, but I'm used to that right. and that's my sound really. The right. sound of me playing through that gear is me mm. on stage. Mm. But for recording, I I just use anything that I need for the song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Be your, your, brother also, or, your brother yeah. also said that he quite often send, well, he sends you stuff Yeah, and if it passes the jack test. <laughs> <laughs> is that what he said? That's what he said. If it passes the jack test, I know it'll be okay. He said. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm a harsh critic. I'm harsh, harshest on myself. Yeah, that I think way. we all are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I'm very harsh. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So, good answers. Um, yeah. So yeah, we we've mentioned you're going on tour with Tim Minchin. You've been playing with Tim for a while. Yeah. Um, now, what's that like playing with a superstar like Tim Minchin? Because well, it's like... He's a pretty special dude, man. He's a special... Controversial as well. Well, I guess, but I just sort of see him as uber smart and mm-hmm. really lovely and, you know... Should I have said controversial then? You can. He, I mean, he... Yeah. I mean, geez, I don't think he'd mind you saying that. Cool. At all. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, he's he's just... Insanely talented. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. I mean, he, he's really good and and he's a really lovely guy. And, um, yeah, so it's a very fun experience. Mm. Um, but how did that come about? Well, it came about through my friend Greg Weaver, who sadly passed away right at – Greg was the sound guy for Tim – and we and after our big tour that I mentioned, Greg actually passed away very sadly on the the, f- the day we got home from the tour. Oh. And Greg was the Whitlam's sound guy, tour manager. There's an Instagram post with him, isn't there? Yeah, there would be. Yeah, there's one from there's there's a Facebook one that I did, and there's lots yeah. of there'd be lots. There's lots. Yeah, because he was well loved. He's sitting and, on one side of the table and. Pies on one side, and I think you're. Oh yeah, I put yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, he's well loved guy, and, right. and worked with the best. You know, right? Like he was Paul Kelly's guy, and okay, boy and bear, and just yeah. Anyway, um, so Greg, Greg actually recommended me mm. the 
the, my uh, Tim's Tim's manager said, "Can you recommend a guitar player?" Tim's coming out to do two shows at the Opera House. This is in 2015. Can you recommend someone? And Greg recommended me, luckily. And yeah, it's been good. Mm. We got on well, and um, we have fun. Well, yeah, the, the, the 15 <laughs> minutes. Clip, yeah, clip's funny. You it's look pretty like, funny. You look like you're having fun. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny clip. Yeah, it is. Um, funny. Yeah. But very Tim Minchin. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he makes people feel at ease. You know, he's right. a, he's he's very he's just a very natural person. Mm-hmm. And um if that makes sense. It, natural but insanely smart yep. and insanely quick mm-hmm. and all those things and talented as a musician and a writer and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And we've been recording an album actually in the last year too. Oh, cool! Mm. 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 Very good. Yeah, and I'm about to go to London with him, well, to England, mm-hmm. Scotland, right, and do a big tour for six weeks that's completely sold out. Fantastic! Yeah, I know it's nuts. Playing what venues? What? Oh, sorry, what type of venues? Well, big theatres. I mean, right? I mean, like that the. I know that one is the Hammersmith Odeon, but it's not called the Hammersmith Odeon anymore, mm-hmm. um, which is fa- famous, the famous venue where, where David Bowie said, this is not only the final show of our tour, but this is the final show ever of Ziggy. Oh, right. Something to that effect. Right. And kind of broke up the Ziggy band on okay. stage. Hammersmith Odeon, 73. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, but like, venues like that, the Manchester Apollo, I think, as well. Manchester Apollo. They're just sort of the ones off the top of my head that I kind of have recognised as gigs. Right. The one in Liverpool where the Beatles played the variety show. Right. In 62. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Man. Sort of old, I guess, classic old rooms, a lot of them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's really cool. Really yeah. exciting. It is. So you'll be over there, like you just mentioned before, um, mm. with your album coming out. My, launch, well, I'm gonna, will you be there for that? Well, I'm going to I'm going to just release a single basically, yep. a warm-up single. Yep. And and I just had the idea of I'm there, why don't I just do a little launch gig, you know? For yeah, it. cool. So, sort of in the process of putting it together. And Have you got a venue for that? Um I don't think yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah, cool. My I'm I'm actually doing this with my nephews who live there and they have a band oh, called cool. that yeah. They have a band called Gentlemen, and so I put it to them: let's do a double bill, Gentlemen and Jack, and oh, cool. and they can kind of play with me, and you know, we'll share share it around a bit. That's yeah. great, man. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. What about next year? Um, well, next year I will put my album out. Yep. Which is going to be called Memorex Cacophony, mm-hmm. and um, next year there's. What else? There's other stuff going on. There's a Tim Minchin tour, a shorter Tim Minchin tour, maybe mm-hmm. a month. Um, and there is something, a Steve Balby thing going on. Cool. Yeah, which is going to be interesting. And also I'll be doing the Big Red Bash again, which I did this year. Now that's like the retro show. Um over four days. Right. <laughs> so we did that this year. Is this where you played the hundred songs? With yeah. Heaps of different. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 So that was pretty fun. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm sure there's more, there's other things and I can't think of them, but that's kind we'll of all right. We'll save that for it'll, an, it'll for unfold. The next, yeah, yeah. We'll save that for the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jack part two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jack Housden, thanks so much for sitting here with me today. Um, it's a pleasure. It's cool to meet you and hang out and yeah. um, heard a lot about you before I met you. Oh. Yep. Cool. Yep. Mostly good. Mostly, no, Mostly good. Mostly <laughs> <laughs> good. No. Yeah, no. You've got a cool vibe, man. I, I can't wait to hear your new music. Um, cool. And I wish you all the best on your on your remaining of this year, your tour with Tim and, and all that stuff you've got coming up next year and... Thank you. Great yeah. stuff. Yeah, cheers. No worries. Nice Thanks. nice to hang. Cheers, Jack. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Thank you. See you, man. See you.